serve stateside or serve so far to the rear they never really see anything. And my meeting Pam showed me the entire other side of it. Because you only hear about the nurse corps who goes forward and sees so much. Whereas Pam doesn't. And I know that Pam doesn't like to talk about it. And she breaks my arm every time I take her someplace. She's been good enough to let me stay in her apartment when I go to Virginia. And that helps me to help her with her VA paperwork because she is still filing for claims for her disabilities. And it helps her to get out and to meet veterans because when she's willing to go with me, I take her. And when she opens up, she does in fact open up. And the first time I got her to talk was in front of a bunch of school kids, grades K through five. And she says, I'm not getting up there to speak. Well, she spoke most of the time once she got up in front and I asked her one question. So I am hoping very much that she's going to do the same darn thing today, only she can't grab her gas mask this time, which is what she did in Missouri. She grabbed for her gas mask and it just wasn't there on that head. So Pam, it's your turn. <laughs> Bear with me, I'm nervous and I'm not used to speaking. My name is Pamela Waterston. I graduated in 1987. I originally did not think of going into the military. Uh, I went to college for a year first, but I was disappointed and unhappy uh, because I didn't want to sit in a classroom and learn what I was studying. I was studying law enforcement. I wanted to go out and do the job. But because of my age, uh, I was not able to be a, a police officer yet. Um, like I said, I did one year, one year college, and I decided that uh, I wanted to do something different. And my mom, um, she asked me, well, you know, why don't you go in the military? I'll give you guidance. And, you'll learn some things and uh, it'll be an experience. So instead of going into the Marine Corps, because uh, I didn't want to do just the really lady thing, um, I decided to join the Army in 1989. Uh, I served uh, almost three years active duty uh, till 1991. I had basic training at Fort Bix, New Jersey, and my schooling was in Fort Eustis, Virginia, and I then was stationed at Fort Story, Virginia, in lovely Virginia Beach. Um, but not too long after I was at the beach, my unit was called up for Operation Desert, Desert Shield. I left in September, and I landed in Saudi Arabia Unfortunately, the day my brother got married, uh, I was supposed to go to his wedding, but unfortunately, duty called. Uh, I served in Saudi Arabia for eight months. My job over there was to operate cranes and forklifts. I loaded and unloaded ships at the port of Al Jabal and Adaman in Saudi Arabia. It was definitely a challenging experience. Um, we worked 12-hour shifts seven days a week. It eventually turned into what day is it, what time, what month, <laughs> where are we? Um, but the, our, job, our job was done and successful. Uh, during that time, there were some experiences that I had. Uh, unfortunately, many were not enjoyable, uh, but that's what I learned is a part of war. Um, we were under constant um, scud attacks. We were constantly donning our chemical gear, running to our shelters. Um, we were in the rear, so to speak, but we were still in combat and still in danger zone because of the scuds. Home from the Gulf. Um, again, I 
had the great pleasure of meeting meeting Miss Wharton, and she's helped me greatly through the years. Uh, when I came when I came back from the Gulf, I went right into the reserves. Uh, when I was in the reserves, I went to Fort Wonderwood to reclass my job. I became a carpentry and masonry instructor. And for my annual training, I went out to Fort Wonderwood and taught other military students the different aspects of carpentry and masonry so they could then move on and serve their time doing that job. Um, problems from the Gulf uh, then prevented me from continuing my military service and unfortunately I was medically discharged in June of 2000. My, my heart's still in the military. I will always feel like I'm in the military. Um, I currently have some close friends of mine that are serving over in Iraq right now. And I hope prayers and support and we think of them often. Because without them serving, we wouldn't be here today and have the freedom that we have. Um, Why don't you explain a little bit about the types of equipment you operated and the equipment that you took on and off the ships? Okay, uh, prior to that, before I should talk about that, I did think of um, when mom said when my mom said that she went through basic training and she was not able to weapons qualify and stuff, it was totally different when I was in. We got down and dirty and we pretty much did the same thing as the men did through our basic training and our schooling. Uh, I learned how to fire an M16. I, went, I was able to throw live grenades. We went through obstacle courses. Uh, like I said, we got down and dirty. We didn't train with men, but we did just as much as what the men did through their training. Uh, when I reclassified in the reserves uh, for carpentry and masonry, I was also allowed to set up and den detonate C4, which was an experience that I enjoyed. Um, it's one of those things where you're hesitant because you're unfamiliar with how C4 works, but once you realize the different steps and how, okay, C4 itself, you can throw it around and play with it like silly putty. But once you put the detona detonation um, equipment into the C4, you don't want to play with it. Um, the equipment I operated over in Desert Shield, Desert Storm, uh, I operated cranes and forklifts. Um, cranes that you see on top of some of the ships are the cranes that I operated and unloaded and loaded equipment off these ships. I operated eight, ten, and fifty thousand pound rough terrain forklifts. Uh, I call them my toys, my Tonka toys. Um, we unloaded just about any equipment you could think of that the military has, except for their helicopters. We were not allowed to unload their helicopters because they were so fragile. Units who operated the helicopters, they came in and they did their own unloading of the helicopters. We would laugh when they'd come in because uh, some of the helicopters wouldn't make it out <laughs> uh, in one piece. And uh, we'd always laugh, and we'd say, well, if we did it, then they'd have all of them in, in one piece. But uh, there's certain things that we weren't allowed to touch. Uh, at the end of the war, if you want to say there was an end of the war, um, the front line did return some enemy equipment back to the ports, and we all 
also were in contact with enemy equipment, and we did load them up on the ships to bring them back for museums, for study, for, for us to play with, I don't know. Um, as much as I uh, say that there's some bad points of me being in the military, I still enjoy it. I still enjoyed it, and I, I don't ever regret going in. It, it has strength, strengthened me in some ways. Um, it helped with my structure and my discipline in my life. Um, I wish I still had the physical training. Um, at first, I kind of hated it. I figured it was a nuisance. But uh, the more I got into shape, the better I felt. And unfortunately, I don't have the enthusiasm to get up in the morning and do PT myself. So. better at questioning the answers. <laughs> um, that's pretty much uh, my, my history. I'm, sometimes people think that it's exciting and I did um, unusual things for, for a female to do, um, but I looked at it as it being my job and my duty and if it was to help others, you know, it's just uh, a piece of the puzzle in the process of getting these equipment to the front lines to do what we need to do. Thank you. Pam doesn't like to get up and talk. <laughs> she is much better at question and answer, so I hope you will have some questions for her later. Now, I understand that Patty has arrived. And because I don't know Patty either, I'm going to ask her to come up here and talk. <laughs> oh, sorry I was late, but I was at a funeral. My name is Patty Fox. I was a first class petty officer in the United States Navy from Oh, October of 1985 until October of 1993. I started out as a reservist in what back in 1985 was the APG program, Advanced Pay Grade. Because I am a licensed practical nurse with an associate degree in health, they equivalated that to a petty officer second class in the Navy. So I came in ahead of a lot of <laughs> enlisted people that weren't too happy, but they, uh, they, I got along and did well. I did my training, my basic training down in New Orleans, Louisiana during Mardi Gras of all times. <laughs> And it was basically learning about the Navy, you know, how do we, we marched, we learned how to wear the uniform, and then I went two weeks to school to learn how to be a Navy corpsman. And that the responsibilities as a Navy corpsman was a lot different than what I did as a civilian nurse. The corpsmen are on the front line of with the Marines, with the CBs, and even though we were women, we had to learn the same as the men did, even though at that time we couldn't be on the front line combat with the men. We still had to learn everything they had to do. Minor surgery, stitching, um, bandaging wounds, and we, we learned it all. And at the, then I was at the Naval, Res, Naval Reserves in Glens Falls, New York. We, as a reservist, you serve one weekend a month and then two weeks active duty for training. And you, they send you all over. I did two weeks in Newport Naval Hospital learning how to be a lab technician. I spent two weeks in Portsmouth Naval Hospital learning how to do, uh, I was an orthopedic tech 
which was learning how to do casting and splinting for broken bones and whatever. And then in 1990, I passed all the tests and became a petty officer first class. And a year later, Desert Storm came along, and I was recalled as from reserve duty to active duty. My first two weeks, I spent down in Baltimore, Maryland, getting the hospital ship Comfort ready to go to the Gulf. We loaded all the supplies, I mean, boxes and boxes and boxes of bandaging and medicines, and we got the hospital ship Comfort is a floating hospital. It had 26 operating rooms. It has, um, it can serve up to 1,200 wounded Marines or sailors. And we spent that two weeks getting that ready to go. However, when the Comfort left Baltimore for the Persian Gulf, I was sent back to Bethesda Naval Hospital and was assigned to the burn unit. And fortunately, we had very few casualties and the hospital was opened back up to civilians, uh, dependents of the people who were serving over seas. And so I spent four months working in labor and delivery at the Bethesda Naval Hospital. But that was exciting too because the, a lot of people, at time of war, the dependents, the family, are at home, and they need support and care, too. Then the Comfort came back, and we spent two weeks unloading everything <laughs> off the Comfort. And I was released from active duty, went back <coughs> to the reserves, and for the next two, three years, I was an active reservist in Glens Falls. Unfortunately, for health reasons, I had to leave the Navy, but since then, I am a civilian volunteer for the Navy Reserve Center in Glens Falls. I am a Navy family ombudsman, which is, I'm the liaison between the Navy, the commanding officer of the Reserve Center, and the reservists who get called to active duty their families, because when a reservist is called to active duty, their family now is entitled to active duty dependent benefits. So we do the insurance forms and the ID cards, and as you know, with the war that's going on now in Iraq, we have had many reservists that are over there, and so we, I take, there's two other ombudsmen in Glens Falls, and we support the families of the reservists that are now on active duty over there. <laughs> That's who I am. Oh, I run the coffee mess on drill weekends, because there are still are several reservists who haven't been called to active duty. Many of them were called after 9-11 to, we had CBs in Guam, Guantanamo Bay. They're now back. And so we do a coffee mess on drill weekends. We provide coffee, donuts, food, <laughs> lots of food. They like to eat <laughs> on drill weekends. And they graciously donate the money that for the Coffee Mess, to Toys for Tots program for the local Marine Corps League. She's very active in the Toys for Tots program. Yeah. And it's, it's fun. I love the Navy, and being an ombudsman really fills the void because the CO at the Reserve Center is very good. He knows that if he said, Patty, go paint that wall, I do it, or Patty, go swab that deck, I do it. <laughs>
is Millie Dillinger. I'm in the book, My Daughter is in the Air Force. My husband said three. Uh, I enlisted kind of like in between wars. Uh, I went in in the mid-70s when it was, you know, it's not just a job, it's an adventure, and uh, I could call the adventure part of it. You know, I really enjoyed it. I was stationed in Germany. Uh, I was military police, and uh, I, just, I really enjoyed it. And I'm glad we've had the opportunity to meet you, finally. <laughs> and young lady? Hi. Um, I'm still in the Air Force Reserve. I've had 24 years in health. And uh, good for you. I sent patients to the comfort, and I might have eaten in the mess hall at the trail with you. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I'm sorry I was late and missed the early part. But thank you for having us today. Thank you. I'd like to thank all these ladies. Oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. I'm Marsha Lehner from World War II Marine Corps. Oh, yeah. in the Semper Fi. United States Marine Aviation Union. Great. Thank you. I want to thank all these ladies. You too? You well, didn't. I'm a retired warrant officer in the U.S. Navy. I came in in 52 and came out in 72 in the Supply Corps. We will talk later. <laughs> All three of you ladies that I don't know. Here's what and then the two that are up here. <laughs> okay, I shall. Colonel Liv handed me something and she asked me to read this. Somebody sent it to a friend of mine over the internet. And she gave it to me and I thought it would be interesting. Wish you were here. For all the free people that still protest, you're welcome. We protect you, and you are protected by the best. Your voice is strong and loud, but who will fight for you? No one standing in your crowd. We are your fathers, brothers, and sons, wearing the boots and carrying guns. We are the ones that leave all we own to make sure your future is carved in stone. We are the ones who fight and die. We might not be able to save the world. Well, at least we try. We walk the paths to where we are at, and we want no choice other than that. So when you rally your group to complain, take a look in the back of your brain. In order for that flag you love to fly, wars must be fought, and young men must die. We came here to fight for the ones we hold dear. If that's not respected, we would rather stay here. So please stop yelling, put down your signs, and pray for those behind enemy lines. When the conflict is over and all is well, be thankful that we choose to go through hell. And it's not just the men who go through hell, as we have shown this afternoon. I'd like to thank these ladies for joining me today. I know it was a nasty day to come out, but they all did, especially Colonel Lib, who I haven't seen in a couple of years, so I was really surprised with her coming down, or up, I remember where I am. Give all these ladies a big round of applause and say, welcome home, because they all deserve it. Each and every one, not only the ones up front, but the ladies sitting down in the audience who served our country. Thank you. Now, I'm going to open this up for questions and answers, and then we're going to take a quick break, because I know somebody's going to have to visit the restroom. And then come back and I'll do a slideshow for you. Anybody have a question for any of these ladies? Oh, come on. Colonel? I've got one. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Francis M. That's right, Francis M. That's right. <laughs> Mike, stop it. Can, can you tell us uh, one of the most memorable moments in any of the three wars. So this is going to be easy for you. We've got World War II, Korea, Vietnam. Memorable, funny, whatever. Something that just jumps out, especially for this audience that they might appreciate. Well, I, I can remember, I was a very young nurse in World War II. Mm -hmm. And we went overseas by ship. And as you boarded the ship, you gave your, you carry, you're carrying a duffel bag and 60 pounds of medical supplies on your back. 
and you walk up the gangplank, there's, there's a steward there, and he says to you, your name, now you give your name, your last name, your first name, and your last name, middle, last name, first name, middle initial, and your serial number. So I got up there and I said, Liberty Francis M. N799517. And he looked right at me and he said, Oh my God, you're a woman. I said, I wasn't last time I checked. <laughs> I didn't have a bunk. They had me down as a woman, a man. So another girl and I, she was, her name was Shirley. And in the South, Shirley is a man's name. So we slept. They fixed us up with bunks. There were four, four bunks in a room, and they sung, slung a hammock between the four bunks in each room. Now, there were four people in that state room that were ill, seriously ill, throwing up in bases. I wasn't one of them. I'm in between. So this girl and I, I used to go out in the hall, where it was cool anyway, and this girl was out there too, and she says to me, let's go upstairs. So we went upstairs. The sailors on duty, there were merchant marines. Sailors on duty said, ma'am, you have to be very quiet. So they put us in between a gun in place. It was cold. Boy, was that Atlantic water cold. So the next night, when we went up, we had pillows and blankets. That always sticks out in my mind. Here was I, I was barely, I was barely 21. And I had come from a very sheltered life <laughs> to be thrown into that. But that was, that sticks out. I've got one, another one for anybody that wants to speak to it, but something most people don't know about being in a combat zone is that you can't tell one day from the only day that was different was the day you could go to church or church or whatever your religion if you were lucky if you, if you yeah but every other day is the same it's, you, you, today we hear 24 7 somebody please speak to that uh, and share this there's she's going to talk well, I, uh, I do recall one day
We took him to the huge Quonset gymnasium. We played kickball with them. We played games with them. And we escorted them through the mess hall with ruffles and flourishes. I mean, here, you know, you've heard all the jokes about mess hall cooking and, oh, uh, you know, something about home cooking. But we were proud to show off our mess hall to these young people. And they oohed and awed and thought the food was so great. And it was such a, a highlight of my Thanksgiving. I have never forgotten that. Thank you. Oh yes, 24-7, um, that is a relatively new term to me, but that's about what it was like when our daughter served in the Gulf War. Um, I would reach over like this and my husband, he wouldn't be there at 2 in the morning, he's down watching CNN. I'm sure there are many families now that are, are the same way. Their loved ones are over there and they're glued to the set. Um, she would call. I gave her our, my AT&T card. I said, I don't care where you are, if you have a chance to call, please get on the phone and call. And sometimes the phone would ring in the middle of the night and we'd grab the phone and it would be her. And we'd say, oh, such and such a thing happened. And she'd say, really? And then we'd say, well, it was on CNN or ABC. Really? I didn't know that. And, I mean, when I served during the Korean War, we didn't have that on-the-spot reporting. I, and then, during Korea, you would go to a movie and see the Saturday matinee and see the eyes and ears of the world and see what was happening, the, the stories of World War II or, or Korea. But, this, this was a whole new experience for us. But then when she said, we knew more about what was going on than when she was in combat, that was something. What, one more thing. I have, I have a small story. Um, we, we lost one gentleman, one soldier, in the whole town of Johnsburg during the Korean War. Two years ago, friends and family put up a memorial in Weavertown, New York, dedicated to Corporal Charlie Ross. I was at work at the Copperfield Inn where I hostess, and I received a phone call from this gentleman with a thick southern, Texas, pardon me, Texas drawl. And he said that he was from uh, up here to put a wreath on his foxhole buddy's stone and he heard all about the memorial that was there. And I agreed to meet him in one of the local restaurants. So he got talking, telling me what a, a wonderful buddy this Charlie Ross was. Now, this sergeant was returned back to the States, and a short time later, Charlie and many of his friends were killed when the hill was overrun that he was uh, holding down. Uh, while we were sitting there, I, he said, what part of the Army were you in? And I said, I wasn't in the Army, I was in the Marine Corps. He says, well, I guess that's okay, too. And he said, oh, wait, I have something for you. And he reached into his attaché case and he pulled out a, a paperback. And it was called Once Upon a Lifetime by Corporal C.L. Greenwood. And the picture was a young Marine coming out of the Chosen Reservoir in Korea. And he knew this man. And he said, I'd like you to have this book. I think you would enjoy it very much. So I turned the book over and I looked and I said, gee, he looks familiar. So after we, we, broke, we parted company and we got back together until for breakfast the, the next couple of days. But when I went back to the house, I started leaping through my Marine Corps pictures and lo and behold, there was Sergeant Greenwood, my drill instructor, Paris Island, 1954. And I was amazed. Here it was almost 50 years, and I met up, or I, I was in contact with Sergeant Greenwood through this, this book. So I contacted my sister, who was in the service with me, and she does computers. And she read through the book and discovered that he was attached to a 
National uh, uh, American Legion post in Illinois. So she tracked it down and, and called. And of course, she called me back and she says, you know, this guy answered the phone. And he said, when I asked him if there was a Carl Greenwood there, he, he turned around and said, hey, there's some bam on the line, wants to talk to Carl. <laughs> and he said, well, uh, he's not here right now. She said, oh, well, I know you can't give me his number, but let me leave my number and uh, my name. And I would appreciate it if he would call me collect. So Sergeant Greenwood called and told my sister they talked 40 minutes. And she gave him my number, and we corresponded. And I still have this letter. And he signed it, Love Grandpa. And I will cherish that letter and that book and the wonderful gentleman that brought me back to, turn the clock back to like it was yesterday. You want to tell everybody what a band is? Because some of those people are not Marines. Beautiful American Marines. Oh, no. Do you oh, agree? No. <laughs> Do you agree? Yes, we're beautiful American Marines. I'm not going to go there. I know what the guys call them. And it starts with broad. And three letters. And three letters. <laughs> yes. With an A. And an S. <laughs> Any other questions? I would just like to share one. Go for it. Okay. One of the things uh, that stands out in my mind um, when I was stationed out in San Francisco, uh, like I said before, I was the only woman in the fleet out there, fifth fleet. And uh, they were asking for sideboys for President Kennedy. He was coming to Alameda. And they wanted sideboys from the plane to where he was going to give a speech. And I said, I want to be one of the sideboys. And they said, no, no, only the men do that. I said, I want to be sideboy. So after about an hour and a half, and I got a lawyer to boot, no, I didn't. But anyway, they finally let me be a side boy for President Kennedy as he got off the, sh uh, the plane. Well, naturally, I kind of stood out because here's all these men. There was 300 men and a wave. And we, we were in our white uniforms, and they were in, I was in my white uniform, and they were in their dress blue. So as the, the convertible drove by, he looked at me and he winked at me. And I'm telling you, I was really, well, I said, I called my mom right away. I said, the president just winked at me, you know. And unfortunately, the next week he was killed. But that stands out. Thank you. I haven't met any presidents, but I should have corresponded with a few. And we won't go there. <laughs> As Colonel Lib knows that I found that back door to Bill Clinton's office. You know, it was very difficult for women in the military in the beginning. They didn't want us. They really didn't. And I think that that has really changed. We had to uh, fight for every step we made. It was two steps forward, one step back. Now, I had one sergeant tell me that he'd never taken orders from a woman and he wasn't going to start now. So I said to him, there's the door. Don't let it hit you in the ass on the way back. <laughs> and uh, so he came back and he said to me, you mean that, don't you? And I said, yes. And I said, another thing, you better learn more about me. I don't give orders and I don't ask you to do anything that I can or won't do myself. Now, if you want to play games, we'll play games. But I said, don't forget whose signature goes on your efficiency report. And I said, I can be mean, or I can be a real witch. So <laughs> you've got a choice. Never had any problems with him again, or anybody else in that, any of the other enlisted men. Now, I have several great nieces. And I don't mean that they're, they're great. Yeah, they are, but you know, they're my nieces, nieces, daughters. And I keep telling them, since they were little, 
that you can do anything you want to do, but you have to want to do it. Well, as they've grown up, their fathers are saying to me, Hey, Frank, don't tell them that. Don't tell them that. Now, I have several nephews that own an electrical company that they inherited from their father, an electrical contracting company. They have sons and one niece, one daughter. So the sons got trained in electrical. One of them's working in it, another one went off to college to learn something else. Now the other one is coming up. They brought those kids up to be golfers. In the beginning, the boys went, this is about the military, the boys went with their fathers and they were golfers, and then they went to school and got their license. When it came her turn, this one girl's turn, they wouldn't let her do it. I was furious. They said, it's a girl. He said, you're all chauvinist pigs. She can do it. She could. Now she wants to go away to be a forensic scientist. And if you don't think her father's worried about that, you're crazy. <laughs> As you can see, I'm a, a rip, no, I'm not a, a woman's liver because I was liberated long before they started that stuff of marching and wearing their bras and stuff. I think every woman can stand on her own two feet and say, here I am. You put up with me. But I am definitely pro. Equal rights, that's it. Equal rights. Amen. Thank you, Colonel Lou. The young lady standing in the back dressed up like Rosie the Ripper. Served during that time frame in one of the plants? No, or are you just no. dressed? I, uh, when I graduated from high school, I went right to work for the telephone. And we had um, a train station in Troy where they had the troop trains go through. And we could always tell when the troop train came through because the board would light up. And we had a lot of fun trying to put the calls through for the service people. Sometimes we work hours, <clears throat> particularly if, if uh, some of these soldiers or Marines or any of the military work down in some of the, uh, the forts and, and places down in the south. And we would work maybe an hour trying to get a service person to the telephone so that they could have a piece of stuff. Okay. And I had 12 years in the Navy Reserve. Well, then you did serve. Well, not after doing it, but I was. But you were before. in the Reserve. Mm -hmm. Same difference. You raised your hand. You said, I do, or whatever that whole. Exactly. You certainly did. You, you did your duty, both as a civilian and as a military individual. And then we got involved with uh, this organization back in 1991, um, right after Operation Mustard Seed, which we sent things over overseas. And John Edwards was on our board. And he said, what are you going to do now? And I said, I don't know, I'll have to volunteer for something. <laughs> and he was then involved in getting the, the museum started. So I've been with him since 1990. Thank you, sir. Yes, you have. Are there any other questions? <clears throat> Anybody up front want to make another comment? OK, let's take a 10-minute break, come back, I'm going to read your poem and do a slideshow. Thank you.